I think if I hear you call me Becky one more time, Six Pack, I'm gonna pop your tops. All six of them. Hey folks, this is Matt once again, and get a little bit more light. Yeah, a little bit more light there. Uh, welcome to. I said I was going to do this in June. My review of the Die Hard films. Now, I have all the films here, and basically, since have some time today. I'm going to be watching all these Die Hard films in the same day. I'll try to review them the same day. Now, when they'll be uploaded, I don't know if I'm going to do one a day, maybe two a day. Maybe I'll do like Die Hard 1 and 2, and then do Die Hard 3 and 4. So, today you may be seeing reviews of these two films. And then, maybe a few days you'll see these two films. Of course, in a way, again, in preparation for next year when you have Die Hard 5. Yes, Die Hard 5 is coming called A Good Day to Die Hard. Which I... Uh, fuck. In Russia, with his son, with a lame title, I... I don't know. But still, I'm a huge fan of the Die Hard films, and you got to start with the first one, Die Hard. Just got done watching this at the end. This is without a doubt a fantastic fucking movie that I have zero, I mean zero problems with. It is without, without a doubt one of the best action films of all time. One of the greatest action films of all time. Hands down. <clears throat> Um, as for the film itself, I know it was based on a novel called Nothing Lasts Forever by a man named Roderick Thorpe, which I think at one time they wanted to turn into a movie with Frank Sinatra. This is like way back in the day. It was going to be sort of a sequel to, I guess it was a sequel novel to one called The Detective, which Frank Sinatra was in. But Frank Sinatra didn't want to do a sequel, so they said, okay, we'll make it a standalone movie. And I remember at one point, this film was actually going to be the sequel to Commando. Yes, this film was going to be the sequel to Commando, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. But then that didn't work, so they made it more of a standalone film, even more so. And they went to everybody. They went to Sylvester Stallone. They went to Burt Reynolds. They went to anybody and everybody. Like Bruce Willis was one of the last choices they went to. And Bruce Willis, mainly he was known for the TV show Moonlighting. So it's like, well, I don't know, do you want to give a chance to a TV actor who only made maybe some little films like Blind Date or whatever? But they did, and history was made with the great John McClane. And one more thing you say about Die Hard that hasn't been said, that's kind of the weird thing about reviewing the first film, is that the film speaks for itself. It's an absolute classic. Um, 8.3 and IMDb, I'm glad it gets a high rating. And all honestly, it deserves a perfect 10 out of 10. $28 million budget, and yet it made about $140 million worldwide. Around 80 some million in the United States. Of course, like I said, Bruce Willis stars. You got Bonnie Bedelia as his wife. 
You got Reginald Vell Johnson as Sergeant Al Powell, who helps out John McClain. You got Alan Richmond as Hans Gruber. You got Alexander Grudinov as Hans Gruber's henchman, or one of his henchmen. Basically, I'm looking through the trivia to see if I uh, not miss anything. Yeah, Richard Gere, Don Johnson, Richard Dean Anderson, they were considered for John McLean. Basically, I'm just looking. Okay. Yeah, Richard Gere, Harrison Ford, Mel Gibson. They, yeah, they just went to anybody except for Bruce Willis for the longest time, but Bruce Willis deserved to get the raw, and he, he made it his own. He really made it his own. Um, now, the director is John McTiernan, of course. This is the guy who a year before had done Predator. So, 20th Century Fox is like, okay, he did Predator. Why not Die Hard? I know John McTiernan, I believe, didn't want to do it at first, because I know the more the novels, more about the bad guys were really political terrorists. It was much darker matter, darker story. And John McTiernan's like, if I could do this, can I lighten this up a little bit? And he does, and that's why you have, for instance, the terrorists, headed by Hans Gruber, they're not really terrorists, they're really thieves, robbers, pretending to be terrorists for certain things. So that the FBI can come in, so they can get into this final lot, so they can get this $600 million worth of bear bonds and stuff. But I mean, basically, you know the story. John McClain, he's a New York cop. He's come to L.A. for Christmas to spend time with his wife, Bonnie Bedelia, who works at this corporation, Japanese corporation. And they're kind of separated. They're on the rocks in their marriage. He gets there, and a fucking Californian... There's just so many things you remember. You even remember the, the guy saying, you nervous? When you get to your hotel room, take off your shoes, make fists with your toes. <laughs> or, uh, like the limo driver, Argyle. I really like this guy who played Argyle, the limo driver. Who, But even the small carriers, you get so much information from them. For instance, like this guy was nervous. It was his first time doing this job. He used to be a cab driver. He, uh, he's like, we got C, B, C, D, T, V, you know, or, you know, what's going on? Why are you here? You know, are you, you know, very fun guy. Uh, Deverell White is the guy's name. Didn't go on to do too much. Mainly, he was in that TV show, Head of the Class. Um, very likable character, and he even has his moments where he gets locked in the in his limo in the garage and at the end he punches uh, that guy out, Clarence Gilliard. Who I think Clarence Gilliard, he's one of the, the bad guys. He's the guy, mainly the technological guy who's trying to break into the vault. Yeah, he would play Chuck Norris's partner in Walker, Texas Ranger. He would go on to do that. He was also on that TV show, Matlock. Um, he gets there, he has a fight with his wife, the, the bad guys come in, and it's basically Bruce Willis by himself. You got the famous t-shirt, you got the famous, you know, not having shoes on, and starts taking the bad guys out one by one. And, you know, what makes Die Hard work in so many levels, I mean, after this family copied it so many times, I mean, how many times have you heard Die Hard on a, or Die Hard in a, you know, they'll say Speed is Die Hard on a bus, The Rock is Die Hard on an island. Uh, sudden Death, Die Hard in a Hockey Rink. Under Siege, Die Hard on a Battleship. Under Siege 2, Die Hard on a Train. Um, Die Hard on a Plane. They, that was probably what they say for Air Force One, or maybe even Executive Decision. Uh, Die Hard in a Space, Lockout, which sucked ass. Uh, there's just so many other films that follow that formula and it's a fun formula it doesn't work all the time like speed 2 and other shit but 
it's a format I usually like one guy against the odds in this one central location. I think what it really works is that you have a very likable hero, yet great villains. Hans Gruber is a fantastic villain by Alan Rickman. He's smart, he's suave, he's sophisticated, but he's not pompous, he's deadly. Uh, at the same time, you always like seeing him on screen. Uh, what also helps with the film is very claustrophobic film. So with John McClane, you know, he's going through construction, but he's also going through elevators and these little hatches and going through the ventilation shaft, you know, the air ducts. Let's get together. Come out to the coast. We'll get together. Have a few laughs. Uh, there's just so many wonderful sequences. I mean, you have a scene where, you know, the bad guys are fire bombing the, the L.A. guys, the SWAT team trying to get in. And, you know, John McClane's like, okay, they've had enough, pull back. And Alan Rune's like, I'll take that under advisement. Fire again. And Bruce Willis gets pissed, and he has these detonators, and he puts his, like, take this under advisement, jerk weed. Pries open the elevator doors, like, Geronimo, motherfucker. Goes down, blows the shit out of the entire fucking floor of the building. And Bruce Willis is watching. Go, oh, shit! Just gets out of the way. <laughs> I mean, and then you have, like, my favorite scene in the movie, of course, with, you know, they're on the rooftop, and you have the asshole FBI guys, uh, Grandel Bush, and, uh, Robert Davi, as Agent Johnson and Johnson. Um, and you can tell John McTiernan has a good sense of humor, where, uh, Grandel Bush says, no relation. <laughs> Or, uh, like, uh, one of the bad guys, Al Leon, he's getting ready for battle, and he, like, steals a fucking candy bar. But it's not too goofy, but you tell it's like, it is a movie, let's have fun. And at times, it seems like the L.A. police are just, other than Sergeant Al Powell, who's played by Reginald Vell Johnson. I'll get back to my point. Reginald Vell Johnson is great as Sergeant Al Powell. Uh, a guy who, you know, his wife is pregnant, and he gets a bunch of Twinkies, and he's called in to look at the situation before it all goes haywire, and seems nothing. But then at the same time, Bruce Willis is getting this firefight, and that's when he gets under the table, and this asshole's like, this time you have just killed someone. Don't hesitate. <laughs> Thanks for the advice. Throws a sh fucking body out, slams right into Sergeant Al Powell's car. I need backup assistance now. Now, goddammit, now. <laughs> And it's a great relationship between the two because it's a relationship through CB radio, but it really works. You know, Sergeant Al Powell by Reginald Vell Johnson, this is a guy who's probably most famous for TV show Family Matters. Um, I always remember him as the jail guard and Ghostbusters and stuff like that. Um, really giving moral support to John McClane, you know, hanging in there, giving him little details of what's going on out there. Um, as well as, uh, what was I going to say? Um, get, telling John McClane the story about like, why he's not on the street anymore. Uh, for instance, he accidentally shot a kid, and that's why he's doing desk work. Which, that even comes back into play. So, it's really good script. You know, it's really good script. I think it's a, it's a smart film. Uh, Stephen E. D'Souza and Jeb Stewart. Did this, they both did the screenplay for Die Hard. So they really did a pretty good job with that. Uh, tying loose ends, stuff like that. But again, while I was saying Sergeant Al Powell, he gives this really moral support for John McClane. And other than him, it seems like all the other cops in L.A. are fucking dipshits or dumbasses or really stupid. Well, you have this deputy chief guy played by Paul Gleason, uh, principal from the Breakfast Club, who unfortunately is no longer with us. You know, he doesn't fucking get it. He's like, crazy, how? You could be a fucking bartender for all we know. Like, he doesn't get it. He's a complete fucking idiot. You have, like, SWAT guys coming in, and one, like, gets struck by a, a flower. To, Ooh. <laughs> Like, it really seems like it's paid the L.A. guys are just losers, except for Sergeant Al Powell. 
Um, but John McClane is a fantastic character. Uh, great lines, you know, talked with Hans Gruber about cowboys. and I was always partial to Warren Rogers. You really have a, do you really think you have a chance against this Mr. Cowboy? Yippee-ki-yay, motherfucker. <laughs> Or like when he's on the roof and he gets all the hostages down, but then the stupid FBI guys are shooting at him. He jumps and says, I'm on your side, you assholes. And then you have, again, my favorite scene where he gets the um, the fire hose and he jumps off as the b fucking roof explodes. Goes down, kids, <laughs> crashes through. It's, it's a film that's over two hours long. I mean, it's 132 minutes. You know, two hours and twelve minutes, and it still goes by very fast. He's, everybody's like, well, even you know the smallest carrier, like the Argyle the limo driver. And you have good moments. You have like the asshole reporter William Atherton, who played a dickhead. And yes, it's true. He really is ridiculous. <laughs> From Ghostbusters, you know, he's a reporter who fucking interviewed their kids and so Hans Gruber kind of put two and two together know that Holly Bonamedelia is married to John McClane and you know at the end Bonamedelia was actually able to punch the fuck out of William Atherton uh, Alexander Grunoff is great as Carl the hench mainly pretty much the main henchman you have the, the fist fight with between him and Bruce Willis and Bruce Willis what's great about John McClane is that he gets scared he gets hurt. I mean, the scene where he gets his feet cut up from the glass. He, he wonders if he's going to make it. He gets pissed. He's funny. Um, like, when he gets pissed, like, he's fighting Carl's like, I'm going to cook you. I'm going to fucking eat you. And he gets really bloody. He gets fucked up. Like, he has a clean, you know, shirt, and then it gets dirty, and then he has to lose the shirt, and he gets cut up on top to bottom. Um, really makes you root for the hero more. I know I'm kind of going over the place, but it's Die Hard. I mean, who doesn't know about Die Hard? I mean, Die Hard just works in every level. Uh, even the ending, like I'm talking about the all the loose ends. Original Vell Johnson, he's able to finally pull his gun and shoot the, the main bag henchman, Carl, to save John McClane. And it's weird, that piece of music, like the music is really well done by... Um, Michael Kamen. Oh, actually, uh, Jan de Bond did the cinematography. Jan de Bond, same guy with Dread Speed and Twister. Very good cinematography here. But Michael Kamen, this is a guy, I believe he worked on Lethal Weapon music, I believe. Could be wrong that, I believe so, though. I'm trying to find... Scores for The Dead Zone. Um... Yeah, the help with the Lethal Weapon series, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, um, first three Die Hard films, Three Musketeers, Highlander, X-Men, Brazil. He's done scores for a lot of films. Um, he did a really good job here with the score. And then, again, that piece of music when Sergeant Al Powell shoots Carl, that's, that's from Aliens. I know, because I have the CD for Aliens, and that piece of music is on there. It's kind of weird, like, I guess, you know, the studio, whoever, thought that score worked better, so they had that score in there. Maybe it was part of the temp track, like, they have a temp track to put in before they hire a composer to compose it. I guess they like the temp track more. Because, like, that's fucking weird that I'm hearing the score to Aliens and Die Hard. <laughs> And pretty much a piece of music that was cut out of Aliens and they put in Die Hard. But then, remember in Aliens when, you know, Newt says, Can I Dream? And Ripley says, We both can. You have that piece of music. Ooh, email. Well, look in later. I'm kind of in the middle. But anyway, the piece of music where um, the hypersleep, and you have that sweet music. I'm doing a shitty job of it, but 
It's like that piece of music is playing, like when Bonnie Bedelia punches William Atherton. You're hearing the music from aliens. <laughs> this is kind of weird. It's like, cool. This is when 20th Century Fuckface was 20th Century Fox. I mean, come on. Predator in 87. Aliens in 86. Die Hard in 88. And you had Commando. And these. I miss that 20th Century Fox. I miss that studio. I really do. Not the studio that is today. I really do. Um, but I mean, the film, so you have that, uh, that touch on Sergeant Al Powell's character, um, Bruce Willis and Bob Medellin get together, William Mason, the report gets his comeuppance, um, Argyle has this moment where he hits an ambulance with the bad guy, Clarence Dillard, punches him and takes Bruce Willis and Bob Medellin home, like everything wraps up. I mean, I don't know what more I can say about this film. I mean, of course, Bruce Wells would play the character and all the Die Hard films. He's a great character. Definitely say this is the best of the Die Hard films. Definitely say this is the best. I could definitely say I have to watch this is my favorite Bruce Wells film. The first Die Hard, I would say, is my favorite. Although I love all four Die Hard films, I really do. But the, the best one, I think, is still the first one. Even that cover is great. And like the tagline and the, and the previews, you know, he's a nice guy to like, but he's a hard man to kill. And it's true, and he's very likable. He's kind of like if Bugs Bunny was an action hero, you know. I know that sounds weird, but you think about it, Bugs Bunny is trying to be an everyman, funny. But if you put him like an R-rated action hero, um, Bugs Bunny would be John McClane in a weird way, if you think about it. Um... And I don't know if maybe that was something else that it was not the norm of having a guy who was funny and um, as well as a badass. But it worked very well. Uh, Bonnie Bedelia would be in the sequel, but unfortunately, you know, it, it'd be nice to see Bonnie Bedelia again in another movie. Same with uh, Sergeant Al Powell, which makes sense to season. L.A. while John McClane is a New York cop, but it wouldn't be nice to see him again. I know uh, Reginald Bill Johnson actually played him again in, I believe it was, let me think, I believe it was a TV show called Chuck, in an episode he played that character, and actually a video game, I did not realize this, there's a game to video game called Dire Vendetta, which now pisses me off because I don't have a game to, but otherwise, even if people say, oh, the game sucks, I would like to play it still. But I don't have a GameCube. I don't have that game. It's called Die Hard Vendetta for GameCube. Sergeant Al Powell, uh, Reginald Vell Johnson, actually plays that voice. I thought, oh, that's very cool. I wish I could play that video game. Maybe one day if I save enough money, I'll buy a GameCube and buy the game. But that's a lot of money to spend for one game. <laughs> but uh, I would love to play that. Um... But everybody does a fantastic job in the film. I mean, you have that asshole Ellis, fucking dickweed, who pretty much tries to save his own ass, but then gets shot for it. Hans, Bubby, is that your dad? <sniffs> Bitch. Dumb fuck. <clears throat> but, I mean, the film itself, it just... Fantastic movie. Um, it really works well from beginning to end. It never lets up. It has a great build-up. Very likable characters. Um, it's a, such a simple yet solid premise. I mean, the fact that they used the building, I think it was the actual Fox Plaza that they used. So you have, like, you know, management hearing gunfire while they're, you know, shooting at the same time. I thought that was pretty funny. And the film just works from beginning to end. You have a great hero, great villain, great s simple story that's effective. You know, I thought it was a good idea that the fact they weren't just typical terrorists, that they were robbers, but they had a plan. They were very smart about it. In very claustrophobic settings and air duts and and uh, it is really hard to do that claustrophobic setting again because it has to get bigger and bigger. I think when if people saw another Die Hard film, well, they're making one, but I think people would like to have a return to the claustrophobic setting 
Does I think they have still have some of that in Die Hard 2? Some of that in the airport scenes. But then you have some in open wide spaces. I think people would like to see that idea. And I'm telling you, shopping mall. It sounds stupid, but Die Hard in a shopping mall. Have it take place around Christmas time again. He he sees his wife again. Well, his ex-wife. But it's like, you know, we don't enjoy the holidays. And, you know, they don't. They're shopping for presents, and they're, you know, by the end, have it be the end of the series, and maybe John McClane will get back with Bond and Bedelia, and, you know, maybe he visits L.A., so you can have a shot for, you know, Sergeant Al Powell, maybe he's captain, maybe he's retired, I don't know. I think that'd be a great fitting into the series, you know, kind of go full circle. You know, you have a first film that's claustrophobic inside a tight setting, that's what the last film should be, sort of claustrophobic tight setting. And shopping mall, that that that's just perfect for like a Christmas season. I think that'd be perfect. The first two were at Christmas, the last two weren't. That could be full force, you know, full circle, so to speak. But that's just me talking. But one more time to say, Die Hard works, Game Busters. You know, when he sends that body down, I have a machine gun. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> now I have a machine gun. Just really great details, great little moments, aside from very wonderful set pieces of action sequences. Hans Gruber falling in slow motion, seeing Alberman's face in the wide shot. It all works. You know, from little characters like Argyle to, you know, your hero and villain. Just, it deserves to be one of the best action films of all time. I think most would say the best. Um, what more can I say? It rocks. But that's my review of Die Hard. Now, I, again, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Maybe I'll just review Die Hard 1. Or, I mean, maybe I'll upload this today. And then I'll upload these another day. Maybe I'll upload these two today. I don't know. Maybe I'll upload one a day. Could do that. Upload just one a day. You know, one day here, one day there. Could do that. That's why I might do. My plan is one a day. It's sort of like a diehard week for people. Um, but either way, thanks for watching. Take care. And stay tuned for my review, review of the very, very solid sequel, Die Hard 2. Which I'll say right now, the short version of the review, I have no problems with this film either. But, you know, thanks for watching, take care, and we'll see you later. Ciao.